Hi, everyone. I am beyond thrilled to be sharing this exclusive interview with you today. I'm going to be interviewing Alexandra Silber, or Al, who is a Broadway and West End award-winning actress. And she's going to share something with us today that she has never spoken about publicly before, her struggle and recovery with bulimia nervosa. So stay tuned. If you are interested in more conversations like this, please click that subscribe button below and the little bell icon to be notified of more videos coming your way. So excited to have Alexandra Silber here today, or Al. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks for being on here. Such a joy to be with you and to be able to discuss this incredibly important subject for the very first time for me. So really nervous, but also um, really looking forward to it. Oh, I'm so honored that I can be the first place that you're publicly sharing your story with bulimia. Well, you made it so clear that you were a empathetic ear and, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a really important message to be able to share uh, about hope and possibilities for treatment in a totally different way of being in the world. So. Oh, awesome. Well, I want to just let everyone know how we met actually, because it's not every day that I get to, you know, chat with a Broadway star. So. <laughs> Um, this is awesome for me too. So we actually met at Broadway Con this year out in New York, and um, I I went to the panel. I can't actually remember what the panel was called, but it was about mental health in the theater. It was. It, I I forget the exact name of it myself, but it was geared toward the concept of mental health and wellness inside the Broadway community, and was interviewing a bunch of people that have been very public about various aspects of mental health, um, as well as um, Dr. Lisa Hurwitz, who is Dr. Drama, who speaks so eloquently about um, psychological issues under the umbrella of a the theatrical lens. Yes. Yeah. It was um, such a great panel. I actually connected with Dr. Drama as well. I'm uh, planning to interview her as well for this, oh, uh, which will be cool. Yeah. But I remember that you and I think one other person on the panel mentioned struggling with an eating disorder during your Broadway time and your yeah. theater time. Um, and so, you know, went up and talked to you after the panel and yeah. bought your book, which everyone should read, uh, White Hot Grief Parade. It was so great. And uh, then I went back to uh, my booth partner, Stephanie, um, with the Broadway Body Positivity Project. And she's like, oh, Alexandra Silver, she has such a great story. Like, you need to talk to her more. So then I uh, definitely reached out and was like, okay, we need to uh, make this connection happen. I want to talk to you more. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, too, because that panel was a a moment that I had really, I think, spoken, I think it was the first time I'd ever really uttered in public about disordered eating as being part of my mental health story. And I mean, I guess I'll just like dive right in to how, how I ended up standing tall here today. Um, you know, my, my hist I grew up in, in a suburb of Detroit, Michigan. And uh, the, the, definitely the sort of tone of my childhood was I was in a profoundly loving and nurturing nuclear family that was um, burdened by my father's cancer diagnosis, which came into our lives when I was about nine. And despite the fact that there were lots of really happy memories and a lot of love in the family, there definitely was a sort of constant anxiety sword of Damocles hanging over us and um, and a very stressful relationship with my extended family, with my dad's parents and family, um, which, uh, you know, was very challenging. And uh, ostensibly, um, my father did eventually quite sadly pass away when I was 18, uh, just a couple weeks after I began my freshman year of college. And White Hot Grief Parade, the book you mentioned, um, is a memoir that sort of chronicles 
that era of my life. And it's a very specific period of time um, and a sort of dialogue between my contemporary self and my 18 year old self, uh, because I don't think we talk about grief very often. And when we do, we don't talk about it very well. And I felt um, moved to sort of get down the specificity of my experience and hopefully illuminate the universality of everyone in the world is going to cross through the gate of losing someone they love. And um, the myriad of ways that we deal with it and cope with it, both healthy and unhealthy. And one of the many things that I decided to come forward about incredibly surreptitiously in the memoir was that the main way that I coped with my grief for about 10 years was a very serious uh, bulimia problem. And uh, it started, I, I chronicle it in White Hot Grief Parade, it started with a very simple omelet in a Greek diner um, and catapulted me forward for a decade and was absolutely the rooting and defining element of my emotional regulation. And, you know, I've been thinking about speaking about this sort of more publicly and more openly. Um, I think that ultimately what I think back on when I reflect on how it became such an effective tool for me was that I was filled with so many strong and violent emotions um, and had no skills or space to appropriately house them. And not only was I filled with grief and sadness and despair, I was also filled with guilt and shame and regret for a lot of the things that I felt I hadn't done well at the end of my father's life, things I didn't get to say, things I didn't do well. And, um, and so there was not only sorrow, but a great deal of like really violent, self-inflicted punishing thoughts. And it kind of created this perfect storm for an incredibly um, self-flagellating behavior that felt, um, it provided extraordinary relief. Um, the way that I would describe it was, is like my, if you will, my stomach fullness cylinder was a metaphor for my emotional fullness cylinder. And it was like there was a big red button at the top. And if it got full, the button got pushed and a ton of panic chemicals would erupt in me. And I would need immediate punishing violent relief in the form of purging. Um, it was incredibly effective. And I think one of the many things I learned when I finally got help was it, it, we continue to engage with maladaptive behaviors because they're effective. <laughs> you know, you go, I'm engaging with this because I feel 10 out of 10 bad, sometimes beyond that. And within minutes, despite its violence, I feel one out of 10 bad. And the process, of course, is learning to surf and tolerate feeling seven out of 10 bad, five out of 10 bad, and, and uh, learning to cope with you know, the gray areas in the middle that are our everyday life. Um, and I think the thing that was also really complicated for me was I didn't follow a traditional binge purge model that bulimia illuminates. Um, you know, I think even as early as 10 years ago, um, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but even as early as then, um, disordered eating models were a little bit more rigid mm -hmm. and uh, you either fell into a specific category or you didn't. And what I found was every time I would just get to like peering over into rock bottom, I'd 
attempt to reach out for help in certain areas and be denied help because I didn't fit the traditional model. Um, sometimes my behavior was restriction and looked a lot more anorexic, but then I would go into a pattern where instead of eating a lot of food or junk food, which I think is often sort of associated with the binge purge model, I would drink a quart of water to create the sensation of fullness and have the experience of the purge just through liquid. And that somehow barred me from getting the help that I clearly needed. Yeah. Um, I really appreciated the evolution of the term <laughs> disordered eating from eating disorder, because I think it it's much more open to the myriad of interpretations and, and nuances. Um, and I think that ultimately it was sort of the thing that rooted me in college to any kind of ability to continue achieving and, um, and remaining functional. Um, of course, there's a point at which that that breaks down and you can't keep your secrets anymore. And the health uh, implications start to catch up with you. And that is sort of indeed what ended up happening to me just as I was graduating from college. And my story, um, it, it, college was definitely um, when the behavior was at its worst, definitely my second year of college. Um, and I should sort of say for the people that, that may or may not know me, um, I, I'm, I have a pretty extensive career in musical theater. So I think a lot of people associate me with singing. And um, just as an interesting tidbit, my degree in theater, I got at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland in Glasgow, and it was, just, it was in classical theater. So singing wasn't really a part of my active daily training. Like we took the odd singing class and acting through song was a part of a bigger picture, but I wasn't being asked to sing at a high Broadway level or even report to a weekly voice teacher. And so there was not a lot of accountability specifically about the effect on my vocal cords, mm -hmm. um, which I think fueled my ability to kind of keep my secrets a little bit better. Um, and of course, youth plays a part in this. You know, when you're 19, you can bounce back from a really damaging body event with a lot more dexterity than you can as a fully grown adult. Um, if I engaged with those behaviors today, it would be a week before I got back to my normal self. Um, so the consequences didn't feel high. I was getting away with it. Yeah. Um, and then I think something that you mentioned, which I think was really, really crucial in terms of like the theatrical lens was I got a, I was so lucky to get a job, a very crazy job right out of college. I was cast in a sort of bizarre Cinderella moment way um, from nowhere. I was cast as Laura Fairley in Andrew Lloyd Webber's The Woman in White in the West End. I was 21, 22, I, 21 or two, um, young. And the entire role was completely sung through, eight shows a week, lead in the West End. And suddenly I had a choice presented to me, which was a defining moment and would become a defining moment in my therapy when I finally got help, which was ultimately, I was not able to keep the bulimic behavior in my life as an emotional regulator and sing and execute my dream job. And so I was presented with which one of these matters more, your coping mechanism or your dreams, and I very quickly chose my dreams and was able to abstain from the behavior and the actions, not the thoughts, but I was able to abstain from the actions that were damaging 
And that piece of information was crucial to my recovery. And over the years, it would come and go. Um, when I was idle, the thoughts would swarm my head and take center stage again. I always liked to say that my bulimia and my depression, which were sort of like first cousins, I think, mm -hmm. um, uh, depression fueled by grief, um, but nonetheless cousins, were sitting at this like round table of my psyche and like, you know, there was my joy and there was my talent and there was my intelligence and there was my bulimia and there was my grief. And everybody got one vote, but those two guys were just really loud and took up all the time talking on the floor of the Senate of my psyche. And I had to keep reminding myself that they still, it doesn't matter how loud they were, they still only got one vote. And, um, I love that analogy. Oh, I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> um, it was just, you know, it, it feels monstrous and overwhelming to stand up to a bully, but they have the power they have. They have the power they have. Um, I'm going to pause you one second there and just um, what please, you yeah. were explaining of, I, I want to just let you keep rolling because you were on, you were Sorry, on, I was oh, like, no, that's a great. paragraph. I, this is so great. Um, but what you were talking about of being presented with those two choices of yeah. continuing your coping mechanism or going after your dream. So number one, I want to say not a lot of people get that experience where they get that choice. You know, they're just kind of trucking Absolutely. along. Therefore, the coping mechanism is just going to stay because either they don't have a dream or it's not something they can actualize right now. So number one, that's like not typical, which is so cool for you. Completely. And I completely acknowledge that privilege. But what you followed that with, I think was something that everyone experiences with disordered eating of it's going to come and go in waves. Like there might be periods of time where there's no behaviors happening. The thoughts are still there swirling around. And then comes a time in life when those behaviors need to come back and cope. And usually, like you said, it's when there's not a lot happening in life. Yes. You know, it's something that um, when you're left alone with your thoughts, those behaviors are coming out. And when you're staying busy, which I think is why so many people with eating disorders like to stay busy, are so perfectionistic is if I keep achieving, if I keep doing something, I can push it away. This is, first of all, yes. <laughs> um, completely identify and strong agree. I think, you know, obviously perfectionism is a huge part of this. And, um, you know, I think it's important, like one of the many things I strongly believe is that like trying not to label qualities as exclusively good or bad. I've tried to say, you know, my perfectionism, which is innate in me, is a quality that has helped me achieve things, has helped me prioritize, has um, helped me stay on schedule, has given me um, a sense of self-worth. But when it's taken to its extreme, it's damaging, like any quality. Um, and I, I have to say that I think my, big, my personal biggest crime against my self-worth was mistaking achievement for turning out okay after after being cut off at the knees at 18 by the loss of my dad and i think i felt an obligation to everything my parents had dreamt for me sacrificed provided i wanted to fulfill my father's dreams for me so that they weren't in vain yeah um and i felt extraordinary pressure to do it um, and I thought that by adding more lines to my resume, it proved that I was healed. And the truth was the disordered eating was keeping me functional and keeping me in an achievement mode, but it was totally um, creating a suspension of the grieving process. I was not grieving. I was not dealing with it at all. Um, I was using the behavior to numb the experience rather than to fully experience it and move forward. And I think a lot of people can identify with that. Yes. And you're absolutely right about being presented with this high stakes choice being huge. Uh, so many people, young people, but 
anyone struggle with their life purpose. And I am so blessed to have known what and felt like I knew what that life, life purpose was quite early. So that when something that looked like it was presented to me and it's like, are you going to blow this? I knew that the stakes were high. And I think I'm also equally blessed to have had at least a kernel enough of self-worth and self-preservation to fight for it when it was presented to me, which also not everybody has as accessibly to them. Today's video is sponsored by my online course, Whole Health for Performers. All the health lessons you never learned in school specifically for performers so that you can give the performance of your life. You can enroll now for lifetime access for only $79. Check out the link in the description below this video to find out all about this course. So here's a question that you've probably, you know, gone through in your mind, but I don't know if you've ever thought about this out loud. When you were presented with those choices, what would have happened if either you weren't strong enough to pursue your dream or you decided that the behaviors were more important? What would life look like now? I, I shudder to think. And... I, I don't know that that projection is particularly useful other than to say that I would be living a smaller life, not out of choice, but out of necessity. And um, I do not begrudge anyone small, beautiful lives. Um, I, especially if they're, they're curated and chosen and elected. Um, but when they are elected out of fear and out of worthlessness, that's when they're troubling. And I think that probably would have been um, the path I took. I, I have to say, I do not know why I was, but I feel that I cannot take credit for the strength and the notion of fighting for myself. It feels like something that is a blessing and is innate. Yeah. Um, and I think it makes, you know, I, I have friends that I've met along the way on this journey and I have friends that have struggled with other equally, you know, life altering issues where I, I recognize that the journey, um, is a rougher road for them. And I, I say to them, and I say to anyone who's listening to this now that goes, you just seemed so strong. You decided to do it and it happened and da, da, da. Um, I honor you and I honor the intensity of your struggle and you deserve even more credit for the fight for yourself. Um, and nothing, worth anything um, isn't hard one. Um, but what, how hard that is, is, is individual for everybody. 100%. Yeah. Um, so I know you've had a lot of struggles with getting treatment, but you told me a story about the day you realized that you needed to get help and do something about it. Tell, tell us that story. Okay. So so um, I, I finished my, the, the sort of condensed version of how I ended up in this spot was I finished my training in Glasgow. I moved to London to do Woman in White and I ended up staying in London for about five years playing wonderful, beautiful and incredibly fortunate roles in the West End. I did Fiddler on the Roof. I played Huddle in London, um, Julie Jordan in Carousel. And at the end of Carousel, um, a, a bunch of things happened that motivated me to come, to leave London and move to America. Um, one was I was going through a very painful breakup of my big relationship in London, um, which was identity shifting and world rocking and painful. Um, the 2008, nine financial crisis was happening around the world. So everything was sort of up in the air. Um, my, I'm from Detroit, which was hit very hard. So a lot of friends and family were struggling. Um, and 
and Carousel as a show closed. So I also lost that job security. And I just thought, you know, I've never lived in America as an adult. Um, it's time to go home and sort of face the music. And what I realized was <laughs> that all of the things that I had sort of left behind me, such as grief and people that knew my family and knew my father and et cetera, et cetera, were all still there. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, d sort of demanding to be felt and answered to in my psyche. I was, again, like really fortunate. I, I got a bunch of work that sort of kept me rooted in the States, not necessarily in New York City, but in various parts of America. I went to Los Angeles, I went to Washington, DC. And I was living alone for the first time in my adult life. And who in that silence crept my old friend bulimia, um, you know, like whispering that it would keep me safe and mm -hmm. buoyed during this difficult time. And the voice was intoxicating. And by the time I finished up um, the job in Washington, D.C., which actually ended up, which was um, Terrence McNally, may he rest in peace, just a few days ago, um, Terrence McNally's Masterclass Opposite Tyne Daily, which eventually became the play that was my Broadway debut. That was in the spring of 2010. And I didn't have anything on the horizon um, so I, I sort of assumed I would go back to London because I just kind of kept moving my ticket, if you will. And time daily generously and, uh, you know, incredibly said, I, I don't think you should go back. I think you should move to New York and I think you should live with me. And I stayed with her, um, on her, you know, in her amazing home. And I real, but the, for the very first month that I was there, I was there by myself while she was visiting her family, her children out in California. And it was in that particular period where I wasn't between jobs and I was completely by myself and I didn't have rehearsal to go to or things to sing that the disease just finally was able to grip me by the throat. And it, it just took center stage and had been, um, no matter how much I had pushed the behavior away, it had been in the hallway doing push-ups, getting stronger. And I just remember one day I was walking through Manhattan during that period of time, that spring of 2010, and I was crossing 53rd Street between 2nd Avenue and 3rd Avenue. And in the middle of the street, I just got hit by a bolt of lightning. I just went, I'm so tired of this being my story. I'm so exhausted by this. I'm so tired of being denied help. I'm so tired of not choosing myself. I'm tired of this being the star of my story. And by the time I got to Third Avenue, I was on my phone frantically Googling places to get help. And at the end of that day, I had found an amazing program at Mount Sinai in New York City that I was able to get into. Um, and it was basically a cognitive behavioral therapy one-on-one -on -one program with just me and a therapist, as well as a dialectical behavioral therapy DBT program in a group that happened um, simultaneously. And um, that program changed my life. And it was uh, about a nine month process total. I started off really grouchy <laughs> and really resistant to releasing this thing that had had its claws in me for 10 years. Um, and also, of course, by starting to heal this behavior the grief that I had been subduing for a decade also kind of came raging up. So it was a very, very, very intense process. I actually had to feel my feelings, you know, um, and not just like, I used to joke that I, I only, I really only cry when I'm paid, but that's not. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, not, you know, sustainable. So I, uh, I remember I started off 
like Goodwill Hunting with this poor, amazing, strong clinical therapist. She was amazing. And I remember this very specific story um, where ostensibly one day, it was the height of summer. It was so hot. I remember that it was so hot in this office and it was like a incubator. And um, I was like cross-armed and not talking. And the therapist said to me, she's like, I'm perceiving some hostility from you. And I was like, well, yes, actually, actually, I, I am feeling quite hostile. And, um, and the truth was, I was feeling hopeless. And I said something along the lines of, because, you know, the truth is, I am very smart. And I've been getting along just fine this whole time uh, without any help. And um, I don't think you're smarter than me. And I don't think you can help me. And I'm pretty sure it's hopeless. And that's why I'm feeling hostile and over it. And she just took a deep breath. And she looked at me and she said, you know, Al, you're right. You are very smart. And I don't think I've ever had a patient as smart or self-aware as you. Um, but I'm really smart about this. And I'm not sitting on that side of the sofa. And I burst into tears and then laughed. And I knew she'd completely called me out and I trusted her. And it was, that was a huge turning point for me. I went from being goodwill hunting to being like president of the group and really was able to take in the painful training minute by minute, breath by breath. And one good choice at a time. And that's really how deliberate and terrifying and confrontational it is. But every time you make a choice to live and a choice for yourself, your self-worth blossoms more and it buoys you to make a good choice the next time. Mm, it's so beautiful. Thanks. <laughs> so... Fast forward to today, how, oh, I don't even know what I want to ask with this, but it's, you know, it's been 10 years since you started that treatment. I know you said that you, you haven't had any behaviors in a very, very long time. You're obviously doing well. You've been doing Broadway and all the things. And um, how is that part of your story affecting you now? You know, I think a really important thing that I haven't mentioned yet and I think is crucial was for me, for, for, for my particular case, and I think this is a really important thing to say that I'm sure you would support, disordered eating and the thinking that goes behind every person's individual disordered eating experience is like a snowflake. It is so unique and there is no typical story. And I think something that's really important to emphasize is that I wouldn't say that body image was not a part of my experience. It was. I own, I signed up for um, being in an industry in which being observed is part of the gig. And observation has pretty much prior to the last, I'd say, 22 months of being in the world, also been synonymous with harshly passed judgment, particularly of the female body. Um, <clears throat> that's not new. I knew that going in. Um, I, like many young women growing up, looked at magazines and images and compared and despaired and did all those things. But I think something that's really important to state is that for me, the emotional regulation and grief mechanism was the leading horse on my cart and the body image was secondary. Yeah. And I think as an actress, that's actually quite uh, maybe a surprising thing to hear. Um, what I would say is, it did affect um, 
certain choices. It did affect certain things I did and did not go in for certain things I thought were and were not meant for me. I remember, um, you know, I've always, for example, I've always had a big problem with my legs, right? Like just, we all have our thing, never like my, specifically my knees. And um, I've gotten a lot of feedback in the world that I am correct about how ugly they are. Whoa, knees. <laughs> I, I mean, right? I, I remember- um, I've never heard anyone comment on knees before. I know it's, you know, but again, it's like, who cares? It's yes, really it's your obsession, it's your obsession. Um, I remember there being an article in uh, the New Yorker that described me as plump legged and going, it's in the New Yorker. There's evidence. There's right. And thinking to myself, I will never play this role that has to, or this role that has to, or this role that has to. Mm -hmm. And as time has gone on, um, and, and of course it kept me from, uh, fully appreciating the function of my body, its capacity for pleasure and expression, um, a, a whole slew of things that had nothing to do with the performing arts, yeah. but also to do with the performing arts. And I think that probably the most profound experience I've had recently was playing Sally Bowles in Cabaret. Mm, yes, very and, costumes. Yeah, and I think always sort of feeling that that role was barred from me for several reasons, from vocal range to body image to whatever. Um, and working so closely with our costume designer and our choreographer, and ultimately, both of whom were female, I should say, which is very helpful, um, ultimately coming to this incredibly profound realization that Sally doesn't think about her legs or her body at all, except for the fact that it is an instrument of delight and pleasure and destruction, something I did identify with. And, um, and that it would be in my best interest to serve her story by not being self-conscious. And she could do things, I say, that I didn't think I could do. And therefore she taught me to let go. Yeah. And that was an amazing gift. Um, and uh, so that journey continues. And um, I, I can't quite announce this yet, but I'm, I'm playing a role this summer, touch wood, that we're, that we're going forward, um, in which I'll have to wear a bathing suit. And I am ready. Like I am, I'm ready to go and not ashamed and proud of my functional female form. Um, and I think that's a, a really, really crucial thing. Um, and another element I think that's also a huge part of my story and filled with so much irony is something I, I do talk about, but not, not a lot. Um, in 2015, literally three days before I began rehearsals for the Broadway production of Fiddler on the Roof, I was diagnosed with a very severe case of ulcerative colitis, which for those of you who don't know, is a, um, an autoimmune disorder that um, affects the colon. Um, it's a kind of a cousin of Crohn's disease, but uh, you see's specificity is it's just the colon, not the whole digestive tract. And autoimmune disorders in general, the, ostensibly their function is that your immune system that is there to protect you when you are ill, um, it's like the lever breaks and it continues to attack your body long after any uh, nemesis is there and it attacks healthy tissue and it's very serious. Um, autoimmune disorders are becoming really, really, really serious. They're up like 400% in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And um, it, I am sort of genetically disposed to ulcerative colitis as an Ashkenazi Jew. Um, but one of the things that was so profound and scary and troubling about the UC diagnosis was very, very quickly within a period of, I, I had sort of, a, I had this amazing bulimic remission that was lasting 10 years. And I wouldn't say that the little thoughts wouldn't creep in the back of my neck, like, ooh, I'm feeling really great in these jeans today. And 
there was something like not quite pure about that thought. Mm -hmm. Those thoughts happen and I give myself grace for them. But in 2015, what started to happen was along with a bunch of other incredibly unpleasant symptoms I won't get into, I lost 30 pounds in about a month. Um, well past the point of anything being cute, yeah. absolutely, absolutely, definitively malnourished and ill. And I, it was a very complicated experience for my psyche because um, when I got the diagnosis, the message of course is you are dying. Your body is shutting down and its skinniness its emaciated appearance is not health, it is death. It is the opposite of being alive. And for the first time, I had achieved this place of healing where I had felt that my body was this beautiful functioning temple, food was nourishment, and suddenly the way forward to proceed with you see at that level of severity is a lot of prednisone, which is a steroid that is a life-saving drug that I'm grateful for, but wreaks havoc on your body in a myriad of ways, mm -hmm. up to and including affecting your appetite, your swelling, your sleep, your adrenal glands, um, and really not being able to eat solid foods. And so I... Had I was sort of thrown into a relationship with restriction against my body's will and my psyche's will. And I had to do a whole new dance and come to a whole new place of peace, recognizing, Al, you're looking in the mirror. You're seeing runway ready. No, you're not. You're seeing emaciation and malnutrition and a very, very sick person. And that required a lot of muscular therapy and work on myself. And I'm above all, and I think this is the thing that I want to say to anyone struggling with a chronic health issue, mental health struggles, or just the daily endurance of being a human being. <laughs> it's at some point in everyone's life, we will be presented with what it means to be alive. Do you want to be here? Will be the question presented to you. And I am pleased to be able to say that my answer to that question was yes. And that isn't everyone's answer. And I recognize and honor that. Um, I'm also excited and happy to have been presented with that question so early in my adult development because I now feel like once upon a time, I treated my body like garbage and treated the gift of being alive in this world and healthy like it was owed to me, and it's not. And now I live with such intention and I treat my body and its function like the gift that it is. And I have to say, to sort of conclude with all of those things, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about achievement and lines on a resume and am I honored to have done the shows I've done and met the people and worked with the people I've worked with to have a Grammy nomination and books and, of, of course, I, I, I am honored to be accomplished. I wish to serve the world as best I can. But truly, this is my greatest accomplishment because none of it would be possible if I weren't here. Mm -hmm. And whenever I struggle, I know that um, because I did this, I can do anything. And I, I wish for everyone listening to, to take that in and, and maybe that can be a piece of corkboard that buoys you in your, in your dark day. You're making me cry. That was so well, beautiful. I, 
<laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm just so grateful to and for people like you that serve people that have struggled like me. And you help people like me lead the lives that we only sometimes dream we can live. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, your story is just so um, compelling. Sorry, <laughs> let me take a minute. Well, I'm so it. honored that you feel that way. I, it's You've been such an empathetic host, like a, a really big bowl to pour my soul into. And um, I'm grateful to and for you for that. My pleasure. Yay. um so that was your personal story and I would love to hear um you know I'm sure you don't you know you don't have the stats or anything like that which you know I we're never going to find like full statistics on this but I'm curious just you know having been around so much of the theater world in school and during shows and all your people that you're with your theater family um what is kind of your take on how prevalent disorder eating is amongst particularly performers, but anyone in the theater world, you know, um, stage managers and directors and, you know, um, obviously so much of disorder eating is very hidden and manipulative and you don't see it, but totally. there, are, there are inclinations or maybe people have told you they're struggling. Absolutely. Um, as you said, I, I certainly don't have statistics, but what I can definitively say is that um, body image, disordered eating, and uh, restrictions are a huge part of the performing arts culture. And I think we have gotten away with it for so many decades because of patriarchal standards, because of, um, and equally the cult of women being cruel to other women and not lifting each other up, um, beauty standards that were not set up by a realistic source. And I really do think that is changing. I think that there is a cultural ground swelling of moving toward a concept of body diversity, of overall health. Many, many types of bodies can be healthy bodies. Many, many types of diets can be healthy diets. Everything being much more individualized and mm. personal and people feeling that they have the right and the ownership to take charge of their health in a way that um, works for them and for their body. Um, and I think that that dialogue and that uh, paradigm shift is making a huge difference in, in what it means to have a Broadway body. Um, once upon a time, that was a very specific, you know, video you could buy on a VHS and do that Fosse workout. Mm -hmm. And you either were or you were not. And now I think, you know, in the same way that I sort of love the body positivity movement of you know what a bikini body is? It's a body wearing a bikini. I say the same thing. You know what a Broadway body is? It's a body that's on Broadway. Yeah. And um, and to me, its virtue should be in its ability to function and its Olympic athlete ability to do what Broadway performers do eight times a week, which requires fuel and nutrition and rest. And yes, all the calories you need all the whole foods you need, all the real sleep you need, and to be proud of getting all the hours of sleep and all the calories and all the exercise so that you can continue to function at this Olympic level. Um, and I think that is taking over. But what I will also say is that disordered eating and all of its secrets also aren't going anywhere. And very often they are fueled by body image, as I said, mm -hmm. but um, the flames, the, the, you can pour petrol and gasoline on the flames with a myriad of other things. Yeah. Um, and those are the secret things that I think haunt anybody with disordered eating. But of course, in the performing arts, you've got a lot of very sensitive people that are being asked to have access to the 
deeper and more intense emotions on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And it's a tall ask. And so I encourage anybody to value health and wholeness and wellness above everything else. So good. And as you were saying, you know, it's for performers, non-performers, it's so rarely about the body image piece and that can be a part of it, but it's not the it's not the cause. It's not the underlying reason. It's, it's about escaping emotions for a while. It's about numbing out. Totally. Um, so, and, you know, and it's such an irony, I think that I, certainly in my experience, I, I could feel grief and weep for Billy Bigelow on behalf of Julie Jordan, but I couldn't do it on behalf of myself. Yeah. And it's such an odd gymnastic contortion that we do as performers specifically um, because it's not just writing about or commenting on it's embodying and um, when I was finally able to give myself permission to feel those things on behalf of myself my real healing began and my work got better if I may say so it um, it it grew and expanded because I had access to the things I'd been denying myself feeling. That's so good. And what you were saying about, you know, holding back from roles that you, you know, for all the reasons, but specifically body image reasons of like, oh, I can't do that. Or you were, you know, afraid of the costume for whatever reason. Really? I, I think has, uh, I think you said your choreographer and costumer said of, you know, the character wouldn't feel that way. Yeah. You know, she's very bold. And I, I've personally had that experience too. Um, oh gosh, it was four or five years ago. Now I had a, a lead role in the play butterflies are free and mm -hmm. for about half the show, I'm in my underwear. Right. And that was a big ask <laughs> and never, never had to do that. Yeah. Um, and the fun part is so community theater, the audience is like right there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's particularly intimidating because you can see them. Um, but that character was so confident and so bold and went for what she asked. And I, I loved that character. Jill right. like gave me confidence and well, I'm not going to go run around the normal world in my underwear in front of people, but like getting the opportunity to play yeah. that character on stage gave me this whole new level of body confidence. And then a couple years pl later playing um, gypsy in gypsy and doing, you know, strip tease and everything. Um, it's again, like things that I didn't know I was capable of right. until I got to embody the character. Completely. And they teach you things about yourself that you, that were lying dormant. Yeah. And you're like, maybe I can, maybe I can let go of that story. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can just release that. And, um, you know, I, I think I remember saying to somebody during the cabaret process, I went, you know, even if Sally does have fat knees, no one's ever kicked her out of bed. And you just go, and that's all she values, right? What? You just have to, um, and I, I think to, to be humble enough to let our characters teach us um, and illuminate the darker shadowy corners of our own souls is um, why art exists. Absolutely. Thank you so much for this talk. Oh, this is my pleasure. This is so amazing. Um, I feel like there's so much more we could cover, but I want to be respectful of your time too. We can always do it again. Yeah. That'd be yeah, great. totally. Well, Al, I'm so thankful you were able to come on and share your story today. This has been so illuminating and inspiring, and I hope it's inspiring for everyone who watched. Thank you so much for having me and for being such an empathetic and generous conversationalist and host. And I, I do hope going forward that in, in sharing my story, people uh, feel buoyed and feel hope. And I wish you all the greatest of health. Good. And if you're interested in learning more about Al or getting her books, I'm going to link them in the description below this video. So definitely check those out and I'll see you all next time. Mm -hmm.